Dr. Shauna Fuller Alade. Originally trained as a medical doctor, Dr. Shola Fola Alade is respected internationally as a pastor, author, publisher, conference speaker, coach and mentor to various businesses, as well as social, political and spiritual leaders. PSFA, as he is fondly called, served faithfully for 23 years as a pastor in London in one of the fastest growing denominations in the world. Together with his wife Ambimbola, they are now the lead pastors at the Liberty Church, where they equip believers to live a spirit-empowered life. Dr. Shola Fala Alade has touched the lives of thousands around the world with a simple but powerful message. His message inspires, challenges and empowers individuals to live beyond their limitations, discover their destiny and live by divine design. He equips people to make an impact in their generation and exercise their leadership influence in society. For two and a half, close to three decades, he has trained and influenced thousands of people through his seminars, television broadcasts and the publishing of the internationally acclaimed quarterly Leadership and Lifestyle magazine. He has written 13 widely acclaimed books, including The Little Things That Could Make a Big Difference to Your Marriage, the 12 things you don't know that could be destroying you, the secrets to winning your invisible battles, and his most recent offering, Leadership Lessons. Hello viewers and welcome to the Marketplace Shift Conference. I'm, my name is Dr. Shola Folaladi and I'm the uh, visionary pastor of the Liberty Church. And we have brought you this conference on the back of the fact that uh, we're dealing with a very real and uh, very virulent uh, situation at this point in time. Unprecedented times, like people say, and it's going to, as it were, bring about diverse issues and challenges, not just health challenges, uh, social and economic challenges. And I believe it's important to prepare uh, ourselves uh, for what is ahead and not just uh, to learn to survive, but to learn to succeed in the midst of this particular crisis that we find ourselves. And on that note, I'm going to be uh, reading uh, from a biblical text to put in context what it is we're talking about. Uh, I am I, a medical doctor by training, but uh, I lead and pastor uh, the Liberty Church. I'm going to bring, in a sense, uh, my skills from uh, my various uh, experiences in life. I also uh, run a business uh, for a number of years. I still have a publishing business. And uh, it's important to know that we don't live in a vacuum. Uh, we live as social beings and also economic beings. And as a result, I think it's important uh, to address these social and economic issues uh, that we are, we are faced with today. So I'd ask you, if you have a Bible, to turn to First Chronicles 12.32. Uh, if not, just uh, go ahead and flow with me. And essentially it says, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at the command. What this uh, particular text is essentially saying is that, you know, uh, it is important to be attuned with what is happening around us. It speaks concerning the tribe of Issachar, the men of Issachar. They were men of understanding. They were discerning. They understood the times they were in, and they took advantage of it by knowing what to do, and doing it. I'm also going to look at a particular scripture in the book of Genesis, chapter 41, 33 to 36. And this is a text about a man called Joseph. And this is a man that also uh, was attuned with the times, understood trends, and was able to read uh, future trends, anticipate them, and prepare for them. And this essentially is the ethos of what it is we are going to be talking about today. Um, and he says, now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. 
let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities that the food shall be as a reserve for the land for the 70 years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So Genesis 41, 37 to 41 says, So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? And this is what we're hoping will be said concerning you in your field. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in as much as God has shown you all this, <clears throat> there is no one as discerning as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. I am praying that it shall be said concerning you that there is none as discerning and wise as you in your industry or in your organization. And then you'll be set over all. Let's bow our head for a short word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you as we open up uh, uh, this session. It is my prayer that you will enlighten us and give us direction uh, for the coming weeks to months so that we can navigate it and not just survive but succeed at it. God bless you all and welcome once again to the marketplace shift and we're talking about succeeding at work after surviving the pandemic. And the reason why we're talking about succeeding at work uh, after surviving the pandemic is, is because I am praying that you will not have to worry about surviving the pandemic, because you will. And so let us look at how we can uh, navigate succeeding after the pandemic, because it is clear that the pandemic could last, they say, for up to 18 months to two years. Because uh, uh, the experts in the medical field said that it may take up to uh, uh, 18 months to two years to come up with a viable vaccine. And before then, you know, there, there, there are going to be various degrees of lockdown and social distancing measures. And the truth of the matter is that we may not be able to return to what we knew as normal until as much as two years. And we know what has happened to the economy so far in the last two uh, months to two and a half months, uh, not to talk of what will happen in the next few months to come. Uh, many are afraid that they will lose their jobs. Many have already lost their jobs. And uh, if, 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 if you look at what's happening uh, in the various parts of the world today, no country is exempt. Even the big nations of the world uh, actually seem to be suffering even more than others. Individuals and organizations uh, had plans for the year <laughs> 2020, but things have changed significantly because of this massive disruption. I think one can say that the fu future of, of work has shifted. <laughs> Not only is there a global shift, but there is a marketplace shift. The market has shifted, many industries have shifted, Many jobs or work as we know it has shifted. I say that the future has been brought forward. Uh, only a few uh, months ago, um, uh, January, I believe it was the 13th of January to be precise, I, I conducted a goal setting seminar where we were planning uh, the next 20 years and looking at preparing for the future and planning you know, this particular year, 2020. And I went as far as looking at various industries over the time, comparing how at the beginning of the century, when we hit 2000, you know, I said that you know, uh, people were planning and, and, and in a sense uh, 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 plotting and envisaging what the new century will bring. And I, and I said, you know, tw 20, uh, 20, yeah, if you think about it, in comparison with 2000, is only 20 years ago. And I said to them that 2040 can quickly creep upon us. 
And I remember at the time, you know, uh, some many years ago, you had to walk into a bank to cash money or to pay money. Now you don't have to, there are ATMs and all of that. So things are shifted. And I went as far as saying that even churches will, in 20 years time, may experience a major shift. And I said, and it was just speculative. And I said that, look, in 20 years time, people may not have to go to church. That we may have to take church to people digitally. Little did I know that 20 years was going to be fast forwarded in two months. Here we are today. And so what does that mean? In my own simple conclusion, I would say the future has been accelerated. The future has been accelerated, which means that the future has been fast forwarded. It's almost like as though somebody pressed the fast forward button to bring 20 years in today. The future is right here and now with us. But there's something about crisis. You see, what is usually confusing in good times usually becomes clearer in crisis times. You know, when you, where you were concerned about things and things were vague, you were not clear about what was important to you. When crisis hits, what happens is that uh, it reduces us all to the barest essentials about what is important. Okay? That, listen to this, Family is important. Uh, things like uh, just basic uh, health is, is important. And those other extraneous other things that we were pursuing are not as important. And, and the other thing that crisis does is that it brings a major dis disruption. And there are certain things that come with disruption. You know, with disruption, you would, you would face uh, uh, challenges. And some of the challenges that we have experienced so far uh, when we look at the economy and society as a whole, there have been many failing industries. Some these industries will be wiped off, as it were. Some particular jobs have been, have been cleared out of the way. I'll give a few, for example. For example, the travel industry has been grossly shaken, massively. I mean, I was just driving on my way here today, and I went past the city airport, and it was as quiet as the graveyard. No plane taking off. No, 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 no plane landing. And, you know, we've never seen this before. Airports are usually buzzing and busy. And, you know, airlines ha ha have shut down. They've had to let go of a lot of their staff. Hotels are vacant. Yeah? The tourism industry is affected. Nobody is sightseeing at this time. The leisure industry is greatly affected. You know, uh, restaurants, pubs, and uh, those kind of uh, places where there's, there's socializing, drinking, and, and feasting, all of that has been greatly affected. Strangely, uh, the, real, the oil and gas industry, apart from the pandemic, has, been, has had a massive blow. And I'll show you some things later on that how, how uh, 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 greatly it has been dented. And, and for a number of reasons, because right now, most people are home. And, you know, when you are home, you are not driving your cars, so you are not using your fuel. And then also planes, aviation fuel is not being used. So the, the prices of oil has plummeted. And then we also have real estate. Nobody is buying homes now. Everybody is sitting at home. Uh, Nobody uh, is, is, is looking, is going out there to buy homes. So the real estate industry is affected. And guess what? Fashion too. There's nowhere to wear your nice clothes to. So even, even though many fashion and retail outlets are now having their prices because nobody is walking into stores anymore. And so when we talk about air travel in the United Kingdom, it was said that last week compared to the week before, <coughs> air travel has come down by 93%. 93%. Wow. Which means uh, for every 10 times that there was a flight uh, 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 last month or two months ago, uh, you know, it's been reduced to just one flight. And, and those flights are mainly cargo flights or charter flights. <coughs> British Airways is making one, uh, sorry, 12,000 people redundant. That is one out of every four employees is being let go of. Boeing in America says they will cut uh, 16,000 jobs 16,000 jobs uh, in Nigeria. Arik Air, I heard, got rid of 95% of their staff because nobody is traveling, nobody is traveling internationally um, and hardly locally. 
I mean, I hear that many financial institutions here in the UK and, and, and in the US and other major cities of the world are letting staff go. Um, I heard that uh, possibly that Goldman Sachs said they, are, they will get rid of half of their staff. And oil prices are, uh, is such that, I mean, we're beginning to see and experience things that we never thought possible. Uh, around 2014, I heard that the oil price could have gone up to as high as $110 uh, per barrel, 2015 to 2019, almost half to $60 per barrel. 2020, as at last week, came down to $21 per barrel because of oversupply and very little demand. I overheard a particular uh, 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 president, or was it a vice president, say that the oil price actually came down as much as $13 per barrel. I mean, these are extraordinary times. Major disruption in, in major industries uh, uh, that, that has brought, you know, a serious failing of many industries, jobs, organizations. I mean, but also the disruption has presented opportunities. You know, that's the thing about this life. While some are going down, others are going up. And, you know, it, it, it is my mission today and objective to Open your eyes to, you know, what the opportunities present so that you can also avoid uh, uh, what it is are the failings. And uh, what does this mean for us? You see, um, as, as the leader of a church and uh, one who has oversight over many people, you know, um, we, it, it, we, I, I said, let us take the bull by the horns because it is important that we deal and address these issues because we don't want a welfare situation where thousands of our members are you know, uh, queuing up for welfare and looking for handouts. Rather, let us prepare our members and prepare people for workfare so that they can prepare and reposition themselves in the new economy that is about to develop after this pandemic and even during the pandemic. What are the growing industries? You see, like I said, in any situation or circumstance you find yourself, you will always see that there are uh, those who will go down and those who will rise on top of it. In the midst of all of this, there are certain economies that are thriving and are thriving phenomenally. The medical field, <laughs> you know, that ca cannot right now have enough doctors. They are looking for doctors, they are looking for uh, med uh, uh, um, nurses, um, you know, lab technicians, biochemists, you know, um, and, and epidemiologists, statisticians, data scientists. That, that field, you know, it, it's evident that there's a future in medicine. You know, I'm sure, um, you know, the society as it is, countries in the world, especially the United Kingdom, <clears throat> will probably make room for more doctors. You know, immigration concerning doctors and medical professionals will probably be eased over time uh, so that, you know, we can build, as it were, an uh, army of uh, uh, medical professionals. Uh, and so you will find that medicine will definitely grow, okay? Um, technology has, has grown. This is the day of tech. <laughs> if you did not know that before, know that now. This is the day of technology. And I will show you in a short while. Telecoms has grown and is growing because communication is on the increase. Education continues to grow, uh, but, you know, uh, with, uh, particularly with the use of, of, of telecoms. And then the food industry, it doesn't matter what is going on, whether it's war, a pandemic, or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, we must eat, people must eat. So food, you know, groceries, uh, um, uh, farmers will continue to thrive. This is what is interesting about this particular uh, um, um, uh, pandemic situation. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the meteoric rises of organizations in this season is Netflix because everybody's at home. <laughs> everybody's at home and, you know, uh, we're all faced with uh, a sit down at home uh, um, um, uh, uh, situation and Netflix has grown exponentially. Could you ever believe or have ever thought that there will come a time where Netflix uh, will have a greater valuation than ExxonMobil? Um, ExxonMobil rather that Netflix will have a greater valuation. Right now, uh, Netflix is valued at $183 billion in comparison with ExxonMobil. 
that is phenomenal. That a leisure or rather an entertainment co company is measured uh, or valued higher on the stock exchange or the stock market than an oil and gas company. Why? Because of the uh, uh, various things that are happening within the oil and gas industry. Zoom, while other organizations are shutting down, Zoom is going up. They have increased their revenue and patronage by 400%. 400%. Everybody is on Zoom, not just churches. Governments use Zoom for meeting. Organizations use Zoom for meeting. Some educational institutions use Zoom for meeting. Microsoft Teams is on the increase. The bigger organizations, governments, and educational facilities are using. My two sons are at home at university. One is doing his, uh, uh, um, his uh, uh, final year exams right now. Both of them use Microsoft Teams for their uh, 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 tutoring and their supervision and their lectures. Tutoring online is, is the future from what we're seeing. Even six form programs, I, eyes are open to interactive classes now. Now, what you're going to find in the next uh, few years after the situation is that some people will not uh, actually need to travel abroad for a master's anymore. Online courses will be on the increase. And you know, uh, what am I trying to say? As, as we uh, navigate this particular, uh, peculiar situation, it's important to note that what, what will this particular situation, what will it present us? And how will our work change? And you as a business person or a career professional, how can you reposition yourself? How can you prepare so that you can take advantage of the crest? Why? Because the likes of Zoom, Zoom, in this period, are bringing, they, they, are, they are literally laughing all the way to the bank. How can you, how can you prepare and, and position yourself with a company or your consultancy so that you can be at the advantageous uh, point uh, where you are leveraging on the opportunities. Okay, so we, we, you, you, you'll find that, you know, disruption and innovation at the order of the day today. You know, you have to be innovative. Um, you know, my son was telling me, uh, you know, that there's been an increase in, in the sale of home gyms. Why? Because you, nobody is going to, to, to uh, general gyms anymore. You can't because of social distancing. So those, you know, people who are very interested in keeping fit are buying home gym equipment. And you, it says you can't even buy them online, that the prices have skyrocketed because everybody is building a gym at home. Uh, I have a Peloton bike, but well, Peloton, you know, is, is, is a spin bike that is interactive, and that has gone on the in increase because people are now exercising at, at home. What are the industries that will grow uh, uh, in, in, the, in the future? Uh, what are the opportunities and growth areas in the post-COVID economy? I can tell you this, you know, for free. Financial services will always remain strong, but there, there has to be a shift or a change in the way financial services will serve uh, people if they are going to remain, as it were, viable. Financial because people will have to uh, uh, spend money and they, they will have to, as it were, uh, bank money and make money and invest money regardless of the situation. So financial services will always be here, uh, but the way they do business might have to change. And so and this, this is what I will say to you. In this season, yeah, the, 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 the watch word is innovate or die. Innovate or die. And if innovation occurs in the time of disruptive change, then stagnation will happen to those who don't embrace it. If innovation occurs in the time of disruptive change, well, which means at this time everybody has had to innovate. Uh, we at the Liberty Church had to innovate quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and to change and shift our approach. From one day, you are speaking, you know, to a live audience in five different services, you know, in two different locations to, hey, you know, now I'm speaking from one point and it's beaming into various homes. It's interesting, yeah? You have to change your approach. Innovate or die. You know, John Maxwell said this, not he himself, but he said his mentor said this to him. 
When opportunity comes, it is usually too late to prepare. I want you to take note of that. When opportunity comes, it is usually what? Too late to prepare. And they say success happens when preparation meets opportunity, which means opportunities never announce that they are coming. They usually spring up on you. And what are we to do? We, are, we need to prepare in advance for the opportunities. But I believe that this lockdown period presents you with an unusual scenario where you can begin to sit down and think and prepare and begin to speculate and anticipate and say, what will the new marketplace be like? And where should I prepare myself for and position myself for best leverage? Okay, I want to say again that the future is here. The future you are waiting for, the future we were looking forward to is here now. And what do I mean by the future is here? We are experiencing what you call an accelerated digitization of the world. What do I mean by that? Let me paint the context for you so that you fully understand this. You see, the world has gone through various changes throughout the world. We started in an agrarian economy, which is, was agricultural based. You know, the main uh, uh, stay of employment was farming and hunting, okay? And then when we came around the 1800s, actually towards the end of the 17, uh, uh, so 17, something, 1790, thereabout, then there was the in invention of machines, uh, you know, things like the, uh, uh, um, things like, <coughs> mass production machines, corn mills, uh, um, railway, and all of that stuff, locomotives. And then what happened was that it gave birth to the industrial age. People left you know, agriculture, they left farming, they left uh, the countryside, and they began to move into cities in hordes. And <clears throat> this, brought, this brought a massive shift to the economy. Nobody wanted to take jobs on the farms anymore. Everybody wanted uh, jobs in the city, in the printing press, in the, in the uh, flour mills, <clears throat> uh, uh, and in places like textile factories. And so there was an over overpopulation of cities. Then <clears throat> in the 1900s, the beginning of the 1900s and the ends of the 1800s, 1890 something, then we had the, uh, uh, the entrance of what we call the communication age or revolution. And this was the period where things like radio was in, uh, discovered and invented. Uh, uh, television was invented. Uh, the phone was, was invented. This improved communication to a massive degree. You know, you could watch some, you know, somebody broadcasting right from your home, listen to people broadcasting from across the world, and speak to people on the phone from miles, thousands of miles away. And that was the 1900s. But you know what? We have come into what you call the digital age or the digital revolution, which actually started at the end of the 1990s. Okay? The 90, I, I remember I came onto the internet in the 1998. Uh, so the internet or the digital age started again. Have you noticed each of these uh, revolution or ages usually start at the end of the century? and then, then develops within the century. Now, <clears throat> in 2020, we have come to, in a sense, um, a massive acceleration of the entry of the digital age, you know, where you know, most of the world was you know, partly analog and you know, uh, uh, um, you know, just ordinary living and face-to-face. -face. What this pandemic has done for us is that it's accelerated the digital age. And what does that mean for us? All of this is not just information for information's sake. It's important to help you note and understand that we are in the age of digital transformation. Uh, this year has forced everybody to go digital. Uh, in the church world, from the church of two, three, four, five people to the church of 50,000, 100,000, everybody had to go digital because of the pandemic and the lockdown. I mean... I mean, I'm in touch with uh, people from various parts of the world, in the UK, the US, and Africa. Africa especially, um, even, is still not fully caught up with the industrial age. <laughs> uh, because they are not as developed in terms of machinery and things. But now they are being forced to leapfrog into the digital age. I mean, I spoke to somebody who is, the, is one of our speakers. 
uh, she's the chief technology of officer of um, one of the foremost uh, and premier banks in, in the country of Nigeria, Nigeria um, Africa's most populous nation. And she said her role has suddenly uh, 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 been leapfrogged. Why? Because all of a sudden, all the projects and things that they had in, has had to be fast-tracked. Why? Because of payment methods. Now, I mean, people uh, uh, apparently, I guess across the whole world, people have been discouraged to pay with cash. And so there are many things that have had to change. You know, she's going to talk about those things more in her session. And she said any bank that does not, that is, is not able to quickly institute those things, yeah, uh, cashless payments and all of those kind of things, and digital transactions, online banking, when it used to be nice and fancy to have them, now in this particular time is a necessity. And so any bank that does not innovate and get into that digital space will lose market share. Yeah, why? Because people have to continue to transact. Governments have had to, to embrace digital transformation because we see that uh, uh, even our, our prime minister in his daily briefings, hey, it is the news, the, 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 the media are, are not there physically. They're all coming by Zoom or, 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 or other technological means. Churches, I spoke, you know, I was listening to somebody the other day you know, he's part of the one, one of the largest churches in Nigeria. And he said something. He said, look, <laughs> that they have lost revenue. Why? Because, you know, even though thousands and thousands of people come to that church, uh, because they are not able to meet physically, you know, they've been used to collecting offerings with basket. Now, you, you cannot give offerings by basket in this particular uh, season that we are in. And he said, he kept saying that, He'd been telling the people in IT that they needed to, you know, devise means to, to ensure that people can give digitally. What am I saying to, to you guys? The future is here. <laughs> the future is here. I remember it, at our church, I, kept, I always used to encourage people that, okay, we have various forms of giving, you know, but, you know, try to, to digitize your giving, you know, by ping it or, or PayPal or something or the other. And then it was an, a, a nice option to have. Yeah, uh, but now it is the only option. <laughs> it is the only option. Everybody has been forced into uh, the, the, the digital age. Everybody. Yeah, and listen to this, which, is, which makes it very interesting because Africa, like I said, is still tr struggling to catch up with the industrial age, but the digital age is upon every one of us. Yeah, whole industries will be wiped out. You see, when I look at Africa, I look at places like Kenya, I look at places like Senegal, you know, what's going to happen to the, to the nut or the fruit seller on the side of the road? Yeah. So what's going to happen is that they, are, those are, they, they seem like big problems, but they are big opportunities. Because I remember, I'll show you in a short while, that there's a man called Mo Ibrahim. Yeah, he used to work with British Telecom. He, he resigned his job at British Telecom to set up his own uh, um, telecoms company. And the, his, his, his colleagues were asking him, why would you do that? He said, well, he said, the opportunities in Africa. I said, what do you mean opportunities? He said, well, um, <laughs> there are 900 million people, close to a billion people. And then he said, he gave some measly number. I don't know what it was at the time. Maybe less than 30 million people had phones. And, and what he was saying is that he is going to, you know, innovate and go, he was going to go and sell phones to the 900 million people. And so what was, seemed like a problem was an actual, actually a massive opportunity. Africa is probably going to be the biggest market that you, you can have at this time because there's, there's a lot of room for growth. But not just Africa, the, everywhere in the world now because you, you'll be amazed on how, what this pandemic has shown us is that many of us are actually behind digitally. Yes, and so it is time for people to upgrade. Universities have had to upgrade digital learning. It used to be an option. Churches have to invest in tech. And you will get to hear later that, you know, uh, concerning banks, but churches, you know, even post-COVID, in the next few weeks, things may, you know, loosen up a bit. But you know what? 
uh, I don't know that they would open up the churches. And eventually, if when they open up the churches, there will have to be social distancing measures. And so, there will be a new definition, most likely, of church services. Larger spacing and reduced numbers. And, and you know, we have, to, we have to find a way to navigate that space. All of these things bring new realities to every single one of us. Uh, and, you know, what this pandemic is showing is that, you know, uh, hey, you have to put your thinking cap on. Uh, you, so if not, the train will leave you at the station. In fact, it's left already. All right. And, you know, when you look at the world, the world has become globalized, which means it used to be, you know, uh, uh, um, a massive place that was uh, distant and disconnected. But the world has become a global village. And why or how did the world become a global village? By travel and communication. The fact that you can get on a plane here and get to New York in six hours instead of three weeks by ship. The fact that you can get on, 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 a, on, on a plane here in the UK and arrive in Lagos, Nigeria in six hours yeah, globalizes the world or helps globalize. Communication, the fact that you can watch on iPhone your family in any part of the world, it made the world smaller. But let me say something. The globalization factors have been accelerated. COVID went from Wuhan to the corners of the world in a few weeks. Why? Because of travel. Yeah. And so what, what, what is happening here is that things, we talk about the Spanish flu of 1918, but it did not move that fast because travel was not that fast. And so what the world has changed, and we need to understand what this new world is like so that we will understand the new place of work, that it indeed has to become a transformed working life. You know, I spoke with an oil and gas, a, a, a CEO or managing director of a major oil and gas multinational company, uh, you know, and, and he, 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 not in Nigeria, but is the, is the MD uh, for the whole of the country. And I asked him the questions about how this pandemic has affected his organization and, and the way they work. And this is what he said. He says, this pandemic will change people's appreciation for risk and preparation. For risk and preparation. What he was saying essentially is that nobody envisaged, <laughs> you know, this kind of shock to the system. And he said, you know, you know, over the years he's had various risk people come in and talk about business continuity plans. And those things, when they spoke concerning them, they spoke concerning them like, oh well, it was things that they just had to do, you know, they were just routine. But you know what? And he said something. He said, I said, how, how has it affected your work? He said, well. Not substantially, because they always used to, you know, come. The compliance people say, business continue. Have you, have you put that in place in case of this and that? Is that in place? And what they have found is that, listen to this, that, you know, uh, they have found that working from home, from a distance and from home, yeah, is the new normal. And he said to me that, you see, they have been practicing these things for years. That just in case certain things happen, Something happens within the government in the nations that they are, so they were ready for it. That's one organization that was ready for it. The question I'm asking you is, are you ready for the new economy? Are you ready for the new normal? And so the next question or set of, 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 of or next question I want to answer with the next uh, 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 set of answers is, who will succeed post the COVID economy? Who? What kind of person? Number one, the future is in the digi digital economy. I just established that. And those who are able to create digital solutions will be the one to thrive. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what field you're in. You can even be a lawyer, yeah? But are you digitally a digital savvy lawyer? You know, are you able to create solutions? Let me give an example. In, look. They say that there's going to be more litigation post-COVID because there are many things, you know, people who have uh, um, rented facilities, wedding, paid 20,000 pounds and more, you know, and they, 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 <laughs> the venues don't want to pay back yeah, and the, the, the couple want to rebook their wedding and may want to go to another venue. So there's going to be a lot of litigation. But apart from that, there's going to be new laws, new things, and 
you know, uh, we, we need to have lawyers who understand, you know, the sp cyberspace. <clears throat> uh, you know, there are so many things that, that, that are going to be developed in this new economy. And it is those who can create solutions, accountants who will be able to, you know, do things digitally, who are able to come up with solutions that, that serve these peculiarities. Remember I spoke concerning Mo, Mo, Mo Ibrahim. Mo Ibrahim came up with a solution for Africa. It, um, his company was called CellNet, about providing cell phones for as many people as possible. He did that for a few years and sold the company for $3 billion. Why? Because, listen to this, he entered into a new developing economy. Yeah? But let me say this, like I said earlier on, Africa is not the only developing economy. Even in Europe today, the digital economy is developing. Clearly, in parts of the world like Africa, South America, and poorer parts of Asia, yeah, you know, there's, there's need for infrastructure development. Why am I saying all of these things? To some, it may sound technical, but you know what? That is where your future is. And so, where, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, you can't just go and do project management because everybody is doing project management. You can't just do a, a networking because you have to think. Because listen to this, you know, the, the new economy is going to shed excess weight. You, yeah, it, it definitely is going to. And the people who will remain viable and employable are people who understand the, these things I'm speaking about. So the future is in the digital economy, and those who create digital solutions are the ones that will thrive and survive. Two, those who see the needs quickly and can respond quickly and create relevant business, uh, businesses and solutions are the ones that will survive and succeed. Yes, there will be an emergence of digital, not just digital businesses, but also logistic businesses. You know what? The future is going to be with those who can develop apps that can solve the problem. You know, my, my son was my, my, my son is part of is co-founding a, a, a company that you know that it's like a, fin, a fintech company, and you know, I mean, I'm going to keep some things on, on, on the wraps. But the, the more important thing is that he said to me, he said, look, you know, people have to devise a way to 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 pay for goods, you know. That man who was selling plantain by the side of the road, the woman who was selling potatoes, I mean, that, that poor lady has to find a way to, to receive uh, uh, money without taking cash. You know, you have to create... And, and you know, the, 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 the lady who's, who's the uh, um, you know, chief technology officer for First Bank, and she'll be speaking to us shortly, she, you know, you know speaks about the fact that, hey, you know what... In, in the UK, we have contact, contactless payments, but it's not a reality yet in Africa. And with COVID right now, there has to be a fast track with that. You know, uh, I just spoke about churches. Churches don't have a, they don't have an excuse. Africa, Asia, India, South America, you ha they have to find a way to, to collect that offering from that market woman. It doesn't matter how, how yes, because if, if the churches are going to remain viable and provide the services that they provide, we have to find a way. I mean, I was listening to, to one of the, of the governors uh, on the news in, 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 back in, in, in Nigeria, in one of the northern states, and the things he was talking about. Say, hey, they have to start preparing for telemedicine. He spoke about the, the way they traced uh, uh, um, um, so, you know, because, because of the lockdown, people were not able to work. So they determined how they were going to uh, uh, give money to people who were poor and struggling. Do you know how they determined? They don't have data. They actually don't have data. And, and so you know what they did? They, what, the, the best they have is people's phone records with, with, with mobile phone companies when they register. So what they did is that and they said anybody who was in, in a week or so, able to credit their phone with just 200 naira and less. 200 naira is less than 50p, yeah, for a week. They consider that person poor. And then they were able to send messages to that, that per, uh, person and wire money to them through their text. Because those are people that, so you see, you have to, you have to be innovative. That's a government serving its people. They had to think outside of the box. 
on how, how they can reach people and respond quickly. This is the age that we are in. And guess what? Any man who comes or woman that comes with an app or technology that can help serve the government will be employed by that government. <laughs> Remember, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, Joseph. Yeah. Who is that wise and discerning man? You know, this is not about what degree and what university you came from. It's what solution do you have? There will also be emergence of logistic businesses, you know, because it, uh, regardless of what you order, food still has to be delivered. I mean, this governor was also speaking about, you know, hey, that, <coughs> that they're encouraging uh, grocery businesses, you know, to start uh, <coughs> uh, uh, digital transactions and, you know, um, you know uh, to deliver food, food produce, which is needed in every home, uh, uh, you know, by, by improved logistics, as it were. So listen to this. If you're thinking of going be into business, don't just think of a digital business, a new app, some new technology. Hey, there's going to be a need for transportation of food. There's going to be a need of transportation of, 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 of things. Amazon is, is doing great, phenomenal now. Why? In fact, they had to employ so many thousand people. Why? Because... Right now, everybody is at home, but people need stuff delivered to them. You know, uh, in recent times, uh, many supermarkets and, 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 and uh, grocery stores here in the United Kingdom, you know, went online. Tesco's online, Waitrose online. And, you know, now it's a necessity. It's a big necessity. And we're going to see more of that. Um, number three, only organizations that adapt and innovate will survive. You know, the, 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 the banker was telling me as well, she said, you know, that uh, there was one time just a few weeks ago where everything was paper trail. Uh, you have to approve a thing. You have to pass a file and paper. She said there's no paper to pass now. And that now everything is, is, has been fast-tracked by digital approval. So they've now seen that there is no need <laughs> to, for paper. <clears throat> And all of those uh, uh, red tape matters are going. Contactless payment is now being sought after. You know, online grocery delivery, logistics. Number four, e-services are going, are, are going to be in demand. E-services of all type. And what that means, like I said, lawyers, firms, um, education, training, everything is e. Yeah? Medicine is e-medicine by Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, everything is going to be e-services, but you know what that presents? The reason why I'm mentioning this is that, you see, if everybody is going digital, you know what that means? We all need increased bandwidth, Wi-Fi. I mean, just over this pandemic, you would have witnessed most people were bored and they now all went on Instagram Live. I, I do an Instagram Live session, 7 p.m. every day. One time, it just kept breaking and cutting, and I was wondering why I realized everybody is on at the same time. And so there's going to have to be an increase in bandwidth. There's going to be an, it has to be an, an improvement of connectivity. The reason why I'm saying all of this, so some of you are saying, so, well, what does this mean to me? It had better mean something to you. Because everything I have mentioned is a business. Everything I mentioned will need ancillary services. We will need professionals for them. And so... When you're, when you're going to study law, you had better go and study cyber law uh, and, and things related to that. Your accounting had better be that way acquainted. And, and various other things, whatever you are doing right now, make sure it has a digital element to it. And then there's also going to be a need for data. De you know, because <laughs> clearly, if we're not, we are not having paper anymore, everything is going to be stored uh, 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 online in the iCloud. So there's, there's, there's also a market for digital storage, yeah? Um, and, and, and so cloud technology is going to be big. Listen to this. All these various things I'm talking about are the opportunities that are going to be created in this new economy. Are you looking to go into business? Open your eyes, study these areas, and begin to prepare for it. Only employees who can reskill and respond quickly will survive. People can work remotely now and still work effectively. That's what one, you know, one lady, a, a lady who's the head of a media organization was telling me, said, look, we have discovered that we don't need this many people anymore. Why? 
because people don't have to come in and people can work at home. And you know what is going to happen? That means there's going to be more, a greater requirement for flexi staff than permanent staff. <laughs> yeah, because, hey, they don't, they don't need that many bodies in, 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 in the building anymore. People will need to upskill themselves to remain relevant. And this brings me to the last part of my message, which is how then? So I just, I just highlighted for you who can survive this new economy. I'm saying who can, how can we succeed in this post-COVID economy? Many years ago, 1998, so that's how many years? Uh, 22 years to be precise. I, I, I did uh, an MBA, and one of the things I, I learned in my strategy class is that strategy is essentially reduced to competence, where competence meets opportunity. Where your core competence meets opportunity. Yeah, that is essentially strategy, which is, uh, what is competence? What are our capabilities as an organization or as an individual? So, for me, my strategy will have to be, what are my competencies? I'm a medical doctor, yeah? I also have design abilities, okay? So I was able to, as, as a result of that, set up a publishing company because they are publishing and printing needs and opportunities. But also, I'm a communicator, apart from being a pastor. What does that mean? It means, listen to this, every single person, yeah, it, when you enter into the job market, you must always think, what are my core competencies? And what are the opportunities in the marketplace? And how can my competencies fit those needs? Don't say, I'm an accountant, I trained as a lawyer, and I do this, as I will always be this. No, think competencies eh, and think opportunities. What are the opportunities? The opportunities are the needs that present themselves. And let me put it simply, there are some needs that will never change. They are essentials. The need for food. People will always need to eat. And so, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what you learned in university. It, if, you, if you can you get into farming or whatever, there will always be a need for food. There would also be a need for health, like we see. Health, we can see, is a premium. And right now, it's going to increase. And so people who go, when you're speaking to your children, who go into health-related degrees, especially digital health now, yeah, are people who are going to succeed and prosper. Power will always be a need. Yeah, power. Communication, like we see, you know, especially in times like this. And the, the interesting thing is that will there be other pandemics? From the way I'm looking at it, there's going to be a likelihood. Because the same virus that jumped from one animal to others, there are other animals around and there are other viruses. And within a space of five to ten years, and this is why, this is not to scare anybody, it's for us to prepare for it, for this kind of life. And guess what? Not just... Uh, uh, pandemics by chance of virus infection. What, you know, you know what, what, what is, can, should, should be worrying and we must prepare for is now rogue states and terrorists have found that you don't have to wear a bomb and kill yourself to shut down a nation. All you need is release viruses. And so there, there will definitely be an increase of biological warfare. Uh, 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 and creation of this kind of thing. So what it is is not to make us scared, but to prepare, to prepare. And this speaks of security. So security is very much needed. And when we say security, physical security and cyber security, because not only do you have biological viruses, you also now have uh, 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 tech, tech, technology or cyber viruses. And then my last point is, what are the three things you need to do to succeed in this economy based on competence and opportunities. I'm going to share very quickly three things. Number one, reinvent yourself or reinvent your business. And when I say reinvent, they would say you could also call it re-innovate. Okay? And what does it mean to reinvent? It is that you have this competence. I give an example. Right now, alcohol companies, companies that make beverages, they are, they are not selling as much through pubs and and restaurants anymore. So what are they doing? They, their core competence is the production of alcohol. They realize there's a need or opportunity out there. There are not enough hand sanitizers. So what are they doing? They have now channeled their alcohol that they would have used in making drinking alcohol to making alcohol 
for hand sanitizers because of the demand. That's the way you want to think. That means they reinvented their capability to, to satisfy a need. Do you know right now, they, you know, there's, you, there's not enough uh, face masks, masks in the world. <laughs> so what's happening? Tailors and fashion designers, I was speaking with a lady who's a fashion, a very you know, big uh, fashion designer in, in, the, in Lagos, and I said, how are you guys? They said, there's not been any business for the last two months. And then I said, so what are you? She said, ah, you know, she, they used to sell clothes for as much as 50,000, 100,000 uh, naira, which is about 100 pounds, 200 pounds. She said, <coughs> they haven't sold anything since because nobody's interested in fashion. But you know what they've now resorted to doing? Making face masks. And they have one as cheap as 500 naira, which is a pound, one for 1,000, and, said, and then the designer ones for 3,000 naira. What am I trying to say? That's what you call reinvention. Okay? And how do you reinvent? You reinvent based on your core competence. Yeah? I... To reinvent myself, what, you know, uh, I can't go beyond my skills or my abilities. I'm a medical doctor. I'm uh, a media person, a design person. I'm also a communicator. And what does that mean? You see, I will show you later that you can do, you can reinvent, but it will cost you a lot. And so, what are the core competencies? So, Honda, Honda, the car, um, the, the, the organization Honda is into engines. And so, by reason of their, they can reinvent uh, from a car company to making motorbikes. And like many car companies have done, you can reinvent to create ventilators. Yeah. And that's the need at the moment. They can reinvent to make lawnmowers. Yeah. But they cannot reinvent to make mobile phones. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, what I'm saying is reinvention has to do with something that is close to your abilities or it will cost you a lot of money. Canon, on another note, their, their area of competence, research <clears throat> and development is in optics imaging. So they, they, are, they, are, they are good at making cameras, copiers, and scanners. They can't make lawnmowers. If not, they will change their whole. So that's number one, reinvent. And when we're talking about <coughs> individuals and vocations, yeah, you cannot reinvent too much outside of the area of your competence. If you do, you will lose time and, and energy. And number two, in this uh, post-pandemic <coughs> economy, you have to learn to reskill. The people who will survive and succeed in this new economy are the people who will develop digital skills. Yeah, and, and the people who will not make it are the people who have not upskilled. And so, you know, uh, just at this point in time, while you are home, make sure you are scaling up, scaling up, upskilling. And then, like I said earlier, you can, when we talk about reskilling, you can also develop new competencies altogether. What does that mean? But that's a lot of hard work <clears throat> and time and money and energy. I know a lady who, um, you know, developed, I graduated from university in the humanities, something like uh, sociology. Uh, psychology, but you know what? She went back to university for three years to study pharmacy. You see, uh, you can do that. <clears throat> and in this new economy that is tending towards health, that's a good place to go. But again, it takes time. It takes money. Okay. And then the last point is to reposition oneself. What does it mean to reposition? Repositioning it, the, the, you know, reinventing has to do with, uh, uh, you know, your infrastructure, you know, uh, your competencies. Reskilling has to do with the development of or adding new learning, as it were. Reposition is a softer skill. It's about how you <coughs> position yourself in the market. I end with these two examples. Um, Blockbuster died. <laughs> died because it failed to reposition itself. Okay, so Netflix as we know it was not around and was not the dominant factor because Blockbuster was the go-to for movies, videos, and they dealt with brick and mortar. You had to go in and buy, I mean, order, uh, rent a DVD. But you know what? Netflix came into the market 
and they, 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 they had a postal form of where you order the, the DVD, it's sent to you, you watch it and you send it back. But then, then they developed streaming. They entered the digital space early. And now they are smiling profitably all the way to the bank. And even before the pandemic, Blockbuster disappeared. <laughs> Why? <coughs> because they failed to reposition. Like I said earlier, men, Tesco, Online, Waitrose, all of the, that, those companies that went digital are the ones that became profitable. At Christmas, most people don't go out anymore. They do their shopping online. And what we're saying is that companies that, this is not about reinvention. This is not about reskilling. It's about repositioning the company. And I'm not talking about the brand. Repositioning the company from physical bricks and mortar uh, sales to moving into the new space to take advantage. You know, many of us have heard about the story of uh, 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 the companies that, that failed to reposition. Uh, in America, uh, the American railway companies were the biggest transporters at the time. And then all of a sudden, with air travel, they failed to, uh, uh, um, you know, to be able to position themselves as, if you ask them what kind of company are you, they will say they are a railway company. But that is a failure in positioning. What they should say is that we are a transportation company. And when they, when they understand that, you're, that look, our, our, our company is about transportation, then they could have gone into the business of air or other means. But they say, no, we are railway. Railway has died. Now, that company is dead. What am I trying to say to you? In this time, in this pandemic, you have to learn to reinvent based on your competence, reskill even within that particular sphere, and then reposition yourself for the right market or that space. I say, there is no point working harder at the wrong thing. There's no point working, there's no point working harder at brick and mortar bookstores because Amazon has taken over. The bookstores that don't reposition themselves are over. You are, I end with this, and I say this to you personally. You either evolve, that is adapt, or you become extinct. God bless you as you take advantage of the new economy. I see you shifting in the marketplace for the best. Emerge stronger, bigger, and better in your field. God bless you.